Hey everybody, welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. In this episode, we're gonna look at another portfolio sent in by you guys. This comes from a viewer named Kathy. It's actually a portfolio uh, that she, I don't think she's gonna follow. It was recommended to her from a large financial institution and uh, it's something else. And it's gonna give us an opportunity not only to talk about, I think, the benefits of keeping things simple, but it's also gonna allow us to look at the real cost of actively managed funds as compared to index funds. And if you're new to that, remember, an index fund just tracks an index, like an S&P 500. Those funds don't need to hire dozens of admittedly smart people who sit there and try to figure out which stocks to pick. In contrast, that's exactly what an actively managed fund tries to do. And there are, I'll be honest, there are some good actively managed funds but what the data tells us is that over time, particularly when you factor in costs, uh, actively managed funds uh, are more likely to underperform an index than they are to beat the index. And the portfolio that Kathy sent in will help us look at some of the hidden costs of actively managed funds. We're gonna go much deeper than just the expense ratio, as important as that is. So with that, let's get right to it. Let me show you her portfolio. Again, this is not one she's actually going to use. Uh, it's one that was recommended to her. And so some background, uh, this was a portfolio. You look at all of the investments in it and you'd think, boy, she must have $100 million to invest. No, this was just under $100,000. So they decided to slice and dice her portfolio into, into about, I guess, 20 funds. I didn't actually count them. It's a lot. Uh, it, it isn't an IRA, so we don't have to worry about taxes. That's good but obviously an incredibly complicated, uh, I think unnecessarily complicated portfolio. Now, one thing I do need to point out here, and it's this last fund right here, this IQ Hedge Multi-Strategy Tracker ETF. That fund was not actually part of what she sent me. What, what was in there instead was a PNC, and this came from PNC Bank, uh, this portfolio, uh, a PNC liquid alternative fund. They didn't actually give a ticker symbol and, and I couldn't find it. Now, what a liquid alternative fund is, you can think of it as a hedge fund that's in the form of an ETF. So with most hedge funds, uh, they have lockout down periods where you can't pull your money out. Maybe you can only get your money out once a quarter or once a year. And that's important for hedge funds because they can swing up and down wildly and they, they don't want folks pulling their money out uh, and causing the fund problems. Well, with an ETF, of course, you can sell anytime uh, you want. And actually, for that reason, uh, there's been a lot of criticism over these liquid alternative funds. They tend to be extremely expensive and in, in a bad market, investors can run. And when they do, it can hurt the, the fund's performance. But in any event, what I did was found what is certainly listed as one of the better liquid alternative funds uh, and used it in its place. Uh, and you'll notice it's the allocation is 25%. So PNC is recommending to this investor in an IRA with just $100,000 to put one fourth of it in a PNC liquid alternative fund, which I have to be honest, I, I can't uh, understand the logic of that at all. Uh, but that's what they recommended. I've done the best I can and used QAI as an alternative. Everything else uh, were the exact recommendations. And um, just a couple other things I'll point out before we look at the performance of this fund is they've got $2,000 in cash. You see that here, 2%, it's a $100,000 portfolio. So 2% in cash, uh, which I find kind of odd. She's not spending the money. And as you'll see, what PNC is proposing isn't free. They're gonna charge her in addition to the expense ratios of these mutual funds, which range from probably, I would say about 30 basis points, I think, um, up to, and we'll look at that in a minute, uh, up to over 1%. On top of that, they're gonna hit her with 1.24% fee to manage uh, what this, what I kind of started calling it the Frankenstein of portfolios. Um, and so, yeah, this is an expense heavy portfolio, and I think unnecessarily complex. Now, having said all of that, what's the performance look like? Well, we can only go back to 2014 because Portfolio Visualizer doesn't have data on some of the funds going back before that. So that gives us, what, seven, seven years of, of, of data. And you can see over that seven years, uh, 
it's had a compound annual growth rate. We see that right here of 8.9%. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind. These funds don't have any front-end sales loads. If they did, however, and if you're looking at those kinds of funds in Morningstar, for example, the sales charges don't get reflected in the performance numbers. However, the expense ratios do. All right, so keep that in mind. So in this case, the 8.9%, and this stands for compound annual growth rate, uh, does reflect the expense ratios. All right, now, uh, and we're going to talk about more expenses than just that in a minute. But what I want to first do is compare uh, this fund to something a little more less daunting. We'll just use the three fund portfolio. So I'll show you what that looks like down here. 50% uh, uh, VTSMX, just U.S. stocks, 30% foreign, 20% bonds. If we analyze these two portfolios, so again, here's our Frankenstein portfolio. Here's our three fund portfolio. And you can see at least over the seven year period, uh, again, not a huge time frame, but it's what we have. The three fund portfolio outperformed. I wouldn't say it crushed it, but it, it did outperform by 62 basis points. Now, I will point out though, that the standard deviation was significantly lower for the PNC Bank portfolio, 8.83% versus 11, uh, just over 11%. And you can see that reflected in the worst year isn't quite as bad. The max drawdown isn't quite as bad. And, and that's valuable. Certainly, all things being equal, we'd certainly prefer, I think, to have a less volatile uh, portfolio. Although, all things being equal, I'd prefer a compound annual growth rate of 9.52% over 8.9%. Uh, and the other thing you'll notice is the portfolios are pretty much neck and neck um, throughout that time period. It's really not until the last six months, honestly, that the three fund portfolio sort of took off. And so who knows? I mean, a year from now, it might look different. Maybe the PNC Bank uh, portfolio is outperforming a little bit. You never know. But here's the catch. We haven't added the PNC Bank 1.24% fee. <laughs> so we have to do that. If you're using portfolio and you want to compare uh, one portfolio with an active man or a management fee and one without, the way you do that is you see this shared fee structure, you want to make that a no. And then that allows you to set up individual fee structures for each of the three portfolios. So for portfolio one, I'll add what I call the PNC Bank portfolio. I set this up ahead of time and that's 1.24%. And then for our, our three fund, I'll put none, assuming we're going to manage it ourselves. And so when we analyze this, and let's just drop back down for a minute, we know that this shouldn't change for the three fund, but just remember 8.9%. Analyze the portfolios, and it drops to 7.64%. And we can see it visually over time, particularly, uh, it really starts to make a big, big difference. And uh, so, yeah, adding that 1.24% annual fee makes a huge, huge difference in the, out, in the outcomes. And this is just seven years. If we were to extrapolate over 10, 20, 30, 40 years, uh, the, the difference would be huge. And we're actually going to get to look at that right now in personal capital. So I've moved over to personal capital. These are all of the same funds that we were just looking at in Portfolio Visualizer. And there's a couple of really important things we can do in personal capital to help us look at that and um, to look at the portfolio and, and its costs. And I wanna show you something kind of related to that. This is, I think, one of the most important articles you can read. Let me make it a little bigger for you. When it comes to actively managed funds versus index funds and the costs. And as you can see, it was written by John Bogle. He, uh, he passed away not that long ago, but he was the founder of Vanguard. He wrote this, published it, you can see here in 20, guess 2014. And he talks about, in this article, the difference in costs between actively managed funds and, and index funds. And of course, we all know expense ratios, and we know uh, that uh, actively managed funds have higher expense ratios um, the vast majority of the time as compared to index funds, but he went much deeper than that. One of the things he points out in this article is that you also have to look at transaction costs. And what may surprise folks is that the transaction costs of a fund are not reflected in the expense ratio. 
And that may seem unfair. It's like, well, why not? Well, if you think about it, it's hard for a mutual fund to know in advance what its transaction costs are going to be. It certainly can maybe look at history and kind of give a, give a guesstimate, but it, it doesn't know what those are going to be in advance. And so um, they absolutely come out of our returns. And when you look at returns in Portfolio Visualizer or Personal Capital or Morningstar, it is after transaction costs. So that's good. But you have to keep in mind that transaction costs are not part of the expense ratio and, and actively managed funds tend to buy and sell a lot more uh, than actively uh, uh, than, in, than index funds. So that's the, the first sort of drag, if you will, on returns for an actively managed fund. J John Bogle talks about that in this article. Related to that are um, uh, taxes. Now, in Kathy's case, this was an IRA, so she didn't have to worry about it. And in fairness to PNC Bank, if, if she'd had a taxable account, for all we know, they would have recommended a very different portfolio. Uh, but it's important to know that the more buying and selling a fund does, it potentially has more consequences for taxes if it's in a taxable account. And if you saw my very last video, uh, you saw that I showed you how to access the old version of Morningstar and see what they call um, a tax ratio. In fact, I'll show it to you right now for one of the funds in Kathy's portfolio. Here it is. This is the Columbia Dividend Income Fund Advisor Class. It's a five-star fund according to Morningstar. And um, I've, I've blown this up as big as I, I can. I know it gets kind of grainy, uh, but you'll see down here, they have this thing called a tax cost, whoops, here we go, tax cost ratio. And you could think of this very similar to an expense ratio. What, what Morningstar is saying is, uh, this is gonna come off the fund in the form of taxes because uh, with actively managed funds, they do a lot of buy and selling that can trigger a lot of capital gains. Sure, they try to do it in as I'm sure in most cases, I hope, in the most tax efficient way possible, but still uh, it turns out uh, that they can't help themselves and it really has a drain on uh, the performance of, of the funds. And this is the five year number. They don't have 10 years yet for this fund, but it's 1.05. I'm looking at the old version, by the way, of Morningstar because this data isn't available in the new version. So you can check out my video on how to, how to access this, uh, not hard to do, uh, but you can look at funds to see just how much the tax drain might be. Uh, in uh, John Bogle's article, again, highly recommend it, he has a section on taxes, and I'm gonna just scroll down briefly so you can see where it is. It's right here, taxes and taxable uh, investors. And you know he looks at some of the differences and, and the different um, calculations of how an actively managed fund generates more tax liability uh, than an index fund. It goes into his calculations in this article. Highly, highly recommend it. So that's sort of the, the next sort of hidden cost, if you will, of, uh, of, of a portfolio uh, of actively managed funds. And the other one he talks about in this article is what he calls the cash drag. I'll show you here. There it is, he has a section on cash drag. The idea here is actively managed funds tend to hold more cash than index funds, and it just sits there and doesn't do anything, right? It doesn't make much money, certainly in today's, today's rates, and you're still paying the same fee, uh, and that's true if you, on top of an actively managed uh, uh, mutual fund, you then have someone like PNC Bank hitting you with another 124 basis points, all on cash. Now, here's the thing. If you remember from the portfolio, we go back, well, actually, we can look at it right here. Only 2% of the portfolio is intentionally put into cash. I've modeled that here with this Vanguard Prime Money Market Fund. And let me try to make this a little bigger for you. I know it's probably a little hard to see. Let me do that. Uh, but in any event, 2% 2, 2 in this case, $2,000 is in um, cash. But here's the thing. If we, and this is one of the nice things about personal capital. Let's go to allocation. So I just went to investing and down to allocation. And um, I've uh, narrowed it just to her portfolio, which is right here. I called it the PNC Bank Disaster, which may be unfair, but that's what I called it. And we come over here to the allocation, we see cash right over here, this dark blue bar. And I don't know if you can read that, but it's 6.32%. We're like, wait a minute, that doesn't seem right. And actually you can see it down here as well. Uh, you're like, well, wait a minute, personal capital, its math algorithm is off. It's just 2%. We just looked at it. Well, the problem is a lot of the actively managed funds in this portfolio hold cash. 
And the nice thing about personal capital is it can sort of, and Morningstar does it too, kind of x-ray, if you will, into each portfolio and see what it's actually holding. And if we click on the cash bar, uh, we see where all the cash is held. We've got our, our VMMXX, that's the actual cash we wanted to hold. But this liquid alternative fund, it has almost 2% in cash. And these other funds, and you can break it all down, you can see them all here. A lot of cash. And if we go back to John Bogle's portfolio, he talks about the impact of cash on a, a portfolio, and it's pretty significant. It adds up. And uh, that's the nice thing about personal capital. You can look at just how much cash uh, is held in each of your uh, individual funds. And let me just show you as an example. Remember, this was 6%. Of course, 2% was actually allocated intentionally by PNC Bank. But the other 4% came from the mutual funds that, that are, are in the portfolio. But let's do something else. Let's pick a different fund uh, portfolio. Remember, this is sort of a demo version of personal capital that I use. And I've used it in the past, as you've probably seen. We're going to look at the Paul Merriman Ultimate Buy and Hold Portfolio. It's one we've looked at in the past. I pick it, we could use any, any portfolio that's just index funds. That's really the, the, the key. We'll look at it and um, we'll go to all asset classes and we can see cash here. Now this is, by the way, a million dollar portfolio. Um, Kathy's was a hundred thousand dollar portfolio. So the numbers will be different, but what we care about are the percentages. And here's cash, 0.29%. So yeah, index funds hold a lot less in cash you know, all, as a whole than actively managed funds. And that cash held by actively managed funds has a big drag on uh, performance, something to keep in mind as you're doing your own analysis and making your own decisions when it comes to investing. All right, I wanna go back to Kathy's portfolio, uh, but before I wanna show you planning and then retirement fee analyzer. We've looked at this in the past. And I want to select just her account, which is right here. Now, one of the nice things about portfolio uh, uh, um, personal capital is in the retirement fee analyzer, you can model different assumptions. So I've assumed no contributions, no employee, employer match. This is an IRA. The growth uh, is at 7.5. I guess that's fine for now. And then I've added in the 1.24% charged by PNC Bank. Now, in this case, the age is 41, right? Well, it's right there, you can see it. If I don't, if I highlight it, it goes to 50. But it's age 41 to age 65. Our annual fees are 1.99%. And assuming we make no contributions at all, we just let this portfolio sit there. Look at this. We're going to pay $204,000 in fees. And of course, if we start to add contributions. And let's just say we max out our IRA or come close. We'll just, we'll just put it at 5,000. That number jumps up, of course. And um, if we think, you know, uh, we're going to get an employer match because we're modeling, let's just say a 401k, and we'll put it at 3,000, uh, the numbers go up. And that's the thing to keep in mind is you're investing more and the, you're going to end up paying more in fees, of course, because the fees are based on how much you have invested. And if you assume a longer time period, maybe you're 25 and you're, you're just getting started and you've got 40 or 50 years to invest, this number is going to get ginormous. So the, the real key, boy, and I can't stress this enough, the, the, the real key is that the expense ratios, the fees that, that advisors charge, they can seem small. 1%, I mean, you can get more on a cash back credit card than that. But when they get applied to your wealth year after year, after decade after decade, the numbers get ginormous. Think about it. What else would we buy where we would be willing to give away even a half a percent of our wealth every single year for the rest of our lives? I mean, it's just insanity. So I appreciate Kathy sending this in. Thank you for doing that. It gives us a real opportunity to focus on actively managed funds versus index funds, understand the cost, not just expense ratios, but the transaction costs that don't get reflected in the expense ratios, the potential tax liability, if it's in a taxable account, that all of that buying and selling can trigger, the, the drag of cash in actively managed funds that can hurt uh, a portfolio. And then, of course, looking at a tool like personal capital, we can actually model all of those 
or a lot of those things over time to actually turn that those percentages, uh, which may not seem like a lot, into actual dollars. And that's when you see just how painful all of this can be. Now, uh, again, I want to really recommend John Bogle's article. I think it's excellent. I'll leave a link to it uh, below the video. I'll also link to Personal Capital and Portfolio Visualizer. Uh, and so, uh, again, Kathy, appreciate you sending in uh, the portfolio. I've got literally now over 100 portfolios to review. Uh, I'm well behind, but if you'd like to send yours in, feel free to. You can actually just leave it in the comment below this video. I will be checking comments as well. Happy to respond and answer any questions you may have. I'll help you out any way I can. Until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is honestly a low-cost index fund.